Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, the legislature calls a rare veto override session to reconsider a controversial bill. Utah's senators weigh in as the confirmation hearings for a new United States Supreme Court justice begin. And with state conventions on the horizon, candidates race to secure critical delegate votes. Good evening and welcome to the Hinkley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinkley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Boyd Matheson, host of Inside Sources on KSL News Radio, Amy Donaldson, co-host of the Voices of Reason podcast, and Rod Arquette, host of the Rod Arquette Show on KNRS Talk Radio. Thank you for being with us. This is a big day in politics in the state of Utah. And uh, I wanna get to this, we'll start with you, Boyd. Um, by the time the show airs uh, this evening, we will have had an, a veto override session by our legislature and a special session called by our governor. Uh, what is interesting um, to set the stage here, we're gonna be talking about uh, transgender athletes. This bill in particular is passed during the legislative session. Uh, the governor vetoed that bill, but it was interesting uh, as he vetoed a, a five-page letter attached explaining his rationale for doing that. Talk about a couple of those key points that he mentioned. So I think one of the things that the governor pointed out to the legislature was was really this idea that first we're, we're dealing with such a small number. We really only have, only have one transgender athlete who's actually participating right now. So are we swinging really big too too far, too fast? Uh, he also obviously was worried about the financial component to that and what that would mean for school districts and for the high school athletic association. And then also looking at the transgender community as well. Uh, and I think part of the message that he was trying to send to the legislature is, uh, is there a better way to do this? Uh, and I think it's one of those where Utah could actually lead out that it's not this either or. I think this is a, an opportunity for an and conversation in terms of how we protect women's sports and women athletes. I know Amy has been following that for a number of years, uh, but how do we do that and uh, show proper respect and opportunity uh, for those in the transgender community? Mm -hmm. Amy, let, let's have you talk about this. You've covered sports for a long time. You know this yeah. issue very well, but that, that's the other side of this one is uh, the uh, people are talking about the women's sports side of this thing along with the arguments the governor made. Well, as someone who covered women's sports for 20 years here in Utah, I would say it's, I think they're setting aside half a million dollars to defend this uh, law in, in court. And I just think of all the things that could be done with that money for women's athletics and athletic opportunities. Um, and when you say one athlete, it's one female athlete. Um, there are four transgender athletes actually participating in high school sports now. And the UHSAA, I think the thing that's interesting, they debated this very issue with input from medical professionals and coaches and athletes in 2015. And they passed a rule that I thought really did the and. It really said there are these, a, a wide variety of situations and these are the way we will handle each of these situations. And then we will address new situations as they evolve. And I thought it was a really compassionate it, it was a really inclusive, it was trying to be forward thinking, and it was actually pointed out nationally as one of the more progressive and more, um, you know, inclusive uh, ways to handle what it is. It's a complicated issue. Even I, I interviewed a, a f the family of a transgender athlete and, a, and an, an athlete who's participating, um, a, a male athlete who's participating in track the, for the first time at his high school. And one of the things that's interesting is that even they say, we understand how complicated this is. What we want you to know about our kids is they don't feel at home anywhere. There isn't anywhere that they feel comfortable. And so we need to ask ourselves, is that really the environment we want to create? And does that do, and when you talk about protecting women's athletics, the single biggest impediment for women to participate and, and to participate on equal footing is money. And if we really want to look at women's athletics, there's sexual harassment and sexual assault that is going on rampant across this country. We could have some really amazing conversations that could transform the experience for women if we were willing to, do, like you say, have an and conversation rather than this, what I think is just kind of this fear-driven, you know, we, we have to do this 
this this way mm -hmm. and 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 I think the fact that it came on the last night of the legislature last minute and is a ban that's what makes yeah. the governor uncomfortable. Hey, Rod, I'll talk about for that for just a moment because this was part of the governor's letter too it was about the process that when it, at the end of the legislative session ban was not ever on the table until until yeah. it was yeah. yeah well I think there were a couple of things uh, that were pointed out first of all I, I've had a lot of people tell me including a couple of legislators we've been talking about this for two or three years now for the governor to come out and say well we never talked about a ban I think that's been brought up in discussions before so I thought that was a bit surprising as well I find it interesting as well that there were two other states that moved in this direction just yesterday Oklahoma and Arizona passed similar bills so obviously there's a feeling in the country in some states and I think here in Utah that they want to make a statement and this is a statement that we don't want to have this happen in this state they're concerned is there compromise there could be I you know this Commission idea I don't know if that will work we'll have to wait and see if that will work but I think people want to make a statement and I think lawmakers have a couple of things coming up first of all they're realist mm -hmm. you know they all have daughters they all you know many of them have families they understand that they also look that they have county conventions and state conventions and elections not all of them are running for re-election this year and there are a few out there who I think are saying well I'm gonna vote against it because I'm not up for re-election those who are up for re-election they've got to look at the public sentiment and where the voters are and the voters want something said I think so, boy, this is interesting uh, to, at the process here, but where we are today. So if this veto override will require two thirds right. uh, and uh, it didn't pass with two thirds. What's happened since then? Uh, and I guess with our House and our Senate, where it appears they feel like they have the votes. Yeah, and it, it may go to, to Rod's point. There are accounting conventions that are uh, that are starting up. And so I think there has been a, a sentiment uh, out there that, hey, this is something that we do need to do. We need to, to kind of put a stake in the ground somewhere to begin that process. So I think a lot of this is the political angle to it. It in terms of uh, they've got to show that they're engaged on this issue, that it matters to them, that they're representing their constituents in their area. Uh, and sadly, it's one of those things that, uh, again, becomes uh, after all is said and done, more is going to be said than is done uh, that will actually protect women's sport and help those in the transgender community. And I think one thing about the actual bill that, that they're that they're going to be turning to law with this, with this override is it has some unintended consequences. There is a section that says that no school district or, and, or the UHSAA, they cannot allow boys to participate in a designated girl sport. Right now, drill team is a designated girl sport and boys participate. And so they will not be allowed to compete. They might be able to go to practices or, or participate in that way, but they're not going to be allowed to compete with the teams that they've been competing with right now. Because right now, the UHSA's view is if there's not a comparable sport for your gender, you like football, you can play with the, with the teams that exist. Mm -hmm. And so those options are now taken away from the UHSAA. They're not allowed to do that. The other thing is the 15 private schools in the state will remain under UHSAA does it, you know, um, governance where everybody in public school will go to this commission, which the commission is to me just such an weird and unusual thing. You're going to set standards. Um, I mean, I am, I, I've been in the crowds and on the sidelines to hear all the horrible things men and people yell at female athletes who are really good at sports uh, and not as feminine as somebody thinks they should be. Um, I think this idea that we're going to make some guidelines about how feminine you need to be to play girl sport and how masculine you have to be to play boys sport is really yeah. kind of a horrifying idea. And it, and it comes down, you know. You want, you hope that commission will be objective, but there's, they're going to be subjective. They're I mean, it, political it, it, it's appointees. political appointees. <laughs> it's going to be a subjective thing. So I understand the commission looking at maybe this is that and we're looking for. I'm not sure if it, if it really is. But it's going to be very, very difficult. Maybe, maybe explore it. Maybe take a look at it, see if that changes. But I don't know if that's the solution to it either. I, the, the answers here are very hard to come up with. No one does that. You can look at what USSA yeah. does. You can look at what Olympic sports do. You can look at what NCAA does or the international um, community does. You know, there's they test uh, hormone levels, mm -hmm. right? There's so there's other options out there that they could look at that don't feel as weird as setting a standard standard right. for femininity yeah. or a standard for masculinity. Yeah. And, and it goes to a point, let me bring this up. I, I've always thought that the governor is trying to be a different type of politician. He's trying to be a little kinder, a little gentler. But in this in this polarized world in which we live right now, he will be attacked and he's getting attacked on this. I, I imagine he'll make a he'll make a comment here.
here in about a couple of weeks at the state convention. It will be real interesting to see what kind of reception he gets there. Boyd, maybe you should take a second on that because it's interesting because yeah. a, a key part that's been brought up here, a bunch of the key parts, but one of the, the Amy mentioned too is this indemnification part of it. So I'm curious how that plays to how the, the governor is perceived on this and the legislature because at, at the end of this day, what we anticipate is there will be an override is what we think right. uh, and that there will be a law in place, but just gives sort of the, the legal indemnification to the groups aimed at that were charged with enforcing. Yeah, so, so I think that's an interesting component to it that we're looking at laws that we know we're going to bring lawsuits with. Mm -hmm. So, and, and granted, that happens on a lot of different issues, but in particular, this is one that clearly will invite a lawsuit. So the fact that they're setting money aside uh, that could be invested very nicely in women's sports uh, and, and that will be needed for, for lawsuits is one thing. So that's one area that I think will give the governor a little bit of, of cover. Uh, I think in terms of the convention that, that Rod is talking about, I think the governor will have some, there'll be some impact there. Uh, but, but I always go back to, look, it's it's always easy to, to shout at your enemies. That is, it doesn't take any political courage to do that. The challenge is when you have to talk to your friends in a little different way, and I think that's what the governor's trying to do, uh, but the friends don't always want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> that is true also. Okay, well, last point. And, and I would say, you know, when you look across the board at, like, how could this money better benefit high school athletes, you're talking about, you know, like a single female student you're going to ban, right? And maybe... A, 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 you know, over the next 10 years, it's going to be in the dozens, right? Like, but what could you do? I've been at girls' games where I had to sit on the ground at a, or I bring my own chair, and right next to us is a men's field with concessions and bathrooms and beautiful stadium. And, and I, what is hurting women is just not having the same investment in what they do. And, you know, being able to travel, being able to uh, have college coaches come and recruit, um, they're, there's so many this is so much more complicated and you could really help just putting an athletic director or an, an athletic trainer in every high school in the state would do more to protect all student athletes in every physically emotionally and um, uh, you know if you look at legally th th there should be that should be something college programs don't run without a, a trainer on the sideline most of the schools don't even have access to a single trainer. But I thought Title IX protected that and answered some of those questions. Did not Title IX but address many of those sue. issues? It, well, it, it addresses some of them, but you have to sue. And so women have sued. I've covered all these lawsuits. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Lindsey Van and, and her companions, mm -hmm. her the ski jumpers that had to mm -hmm. sue to get in. So you, there, there are laws that protect you, but you have to challenge them. Challenge and so you have to have a lawyer willing to take on the case. And again, it's always, there's nobody's willingly saying, oh, let's do the same amount of money mm -hmm. in this sport as that sport, right? And it's, it's, we know it's not right, but it's, it persists. And so. Uh, I want to, yeah. I want to see how this leads into it, Rod, since you brought it up. So we, <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting, we're in election season now. Uh -huh. People are going through, we've just had, we had the Republican caucuses. We just had the Democratic caucuses. I want to talk about what's happening there because it's just so interesting in Utah right now. Uh, the, the Democrats met this, this past week, and um, what was interesting is some very high-profile Democrats, even there, are saying, well, I'm not sure we want you to support the Democrat. We want you to support <laughs> Evan McMullen. <laughs> Sad commentary on the Democratic Party, in my opinion, here in the state of Utah. If they can't field the candidate, or they're saying we're going with this well, independent. they do have a candidate. They do have a candidate, but they aren't going to support him. And I, I think, well, two of them already, uh, McAdams and Wilson, have already come out and said, you know, let's think about Evan McMullen, because we think he has the best chance against Mike Lee and not the candidate we have already. Sad statement on the state of the Democratic Party here in the state of Utah, I think. Yeah. Don't yeah, you think I, it's I, also a, sta a sad statement on why a super majority is not good for us, the voters. It's not good for the political system in general because then are, are you don't Are you talking even, about redistricting? No, I'm talking about I'm talking <laughs> about when argument. you have a supermajority, then people don't think we need this ideology versus this mm -hmm. ideology in the race, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's the one can never win. Yeah. I mean they're saying a democrat can never win a state right wide race. That's so we are so giving up on that ideology that we support, that we say we support, and we're just going to try to game the system a yeah. different way, yeah. right? And yeah. that's, to me, as much an indictment of what their party state is, but also 
what this this idea that a supermajority it's very toxic yeah. it's not good well, and, and it's not just in the state of Utah no. you, you look at California yeah. or mm -hmm. Oregon yeah. or Washington uh, and and you can't blame the Democrats in California for having a supermajority it's not their fault Republicans ha in California have to put up a better candidate and a better argument in terms of what they are for they haven't done that here in the state of Utah the Democrats have not put up the argument uh, to cause people to be any different if, if I were a Democratic strategist I would look at the state of Utah because it is a center right to center left state for the most part uh, and I think there are arguments to be made there but you have to make the case uh, and again so it's, it's not California Democrats that are the problem in having a supermajority in California that's a Republican problem uh, hey, boy, here it's a little bit different uh, let me ask you uh, about the, uh, this comment from uh, Salt Lake County Mayor Jenny Wilson um, which was part of this caucus and just kind of see how that plays with what you just talked about because she, she got to Evan McMullen specifically she said I'm well aware Evan McMullen would not be as good as a Democrat in terms of my values and what I believe, but I expect he would invite us into the room when he's making tough decisions. That's not an opportunity Mike Lee is affording me right now. <laughs> How does so? How is that received? How does that carry forward? Yeah, so it, it, it's the same argument, and it's it's sort of this idea of what are we against uh, rather than what we are for. And if uh, you can win elections based on what you're against, and we're seeing a lot of that already in this race mm -hmm. in terms of people saying I'm against, I'm against, I'm against. Uh, you, you can win an election that way, but you can't lead anything that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of the challenges you'll see in this race, uh, you've had Evan McMullen say that he would not join either the Democratic caucus or the Republican caucus in the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's a 50-50 Senate. Uh, if you had the senator from Utah not part of either caucus, that means we would have no committee assignments or representation there. Uh, it could put uh, keep Chuck Schumer in the chair as leader of the Senate. Uh, so there's a lot of very interesting ramifications that are coming out uh, around all of that. But I really think uh, in this race, whoever gets to the, this is what we're for, mm -hmm. these are the principles I believe in, these are the policies that go with it, and here's why, uh, I think that's the winning argument in this case. It is not Democrats being against this, so we're going to be okay with an independent, uh, nor is it okay for uh, Republicans to say that we're against this. You know, you, you got to have a, a vision of what you're for. But, is it, oh, but don't you think it's even just a matter of trying to get in the room to be part of the conversation? Again, when you have a supermajority, they don't need to consult with you. And what Mayor Wilson is saying is at least he will invite us to the table. So maybe ideologically, they're not saying we have to agree on everything. They're not even talking about, you know, being in, being ruling, but it's being part of the leadership, being in the room where it happens. She's saying he will invite us in. What, and, and I also think that in Utah you hear a lot of independents, which I fashion myself as, uh, saying um, we we don't want we want to look beyond the party we don't want to look at the letter behind your name we want to know what you think and we want to know what you're for we want to know what you're going to do for us right but I still think so many of us default to that letter behind the name that what Evans candidacy is going to test one of the things it'll test a lot of things like you say but one of the things it's going to test is do we actually care about that do we actually know um, you know as I've watched the Supreme Court hearings I would like to know how some of these senators feel about yeah. those issues yeah. they're te they're asking yeah. the question yeah. Yeah. And, and well, I think, I think, that, I think, I think to Amy's point that this is a this is not an independent a Democrat or a Republican problem this is a we the people issue uh, and unless we're willing to look beyond the letter, unless we're willing to say, live up to the principles you profess to believe, or that I profess to believe, the, the big question is, what are you afraid of? Uh, I always ask the Democrats, <laughs> what are you afraid of? Uh, I ask leadership in, on the Republican side, what are you afraid of? And the, what they're afraid of is losing power. And what are you, is it Chuck Schumer being in charge or Mitch yeah. McConnell? Yeah. That's well, what it's yeah. afraid of. Well, I, think right. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, um, I know, exactly. I, I thought, I thought the moment. comment from Wilson was interesting. Is there any guarantee that McMullen will, in fact, invite her into the meeting. First of all, and to Boyd's point, if he does not caucus with either party when he's in Washington, you can meet with him all you want. He'll have zippo power, zippo influence in Washington. So you can invite her in all the time. He's not going to have any power. He still if he, has a vote if, in a 50-50 Congress. Uh, 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 yeah, but Senate. if he's not caucusing, he's powerless. The committee, the committee yeah. work would the be committee the committee work. Yeah. But yeah, it won't happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more point on this. Uh, it's more about the, the timelines and how this is going to impact. Uh, Boyd, this year, you have to affiliate on March 31st. First. Yeah. This is a change. It's a little earlier than it has been. You know, this is, they call this kind of this party rating. There's a couple of quote, you know, names for what people said was happening where some would say, I'm going to affiliate as a Republican just so I can vote maybe 
maybe just who I like or maybe who I think will lose. Uh, I don't know. You got, you got your I'll choices there. But, but that's that's what's happening this, this year, March 31st. Yeah, it's March 31st, and uh, if, if you look at the numbers, there there has been a lot of talk about, you know, changing party affiliation. There hasn't really been that much movement. Uh, the only movement that's really happened is a little bit more towards the independent. Yeah. Um, but not a lot moving left and not, not a lot moving right either. Mm -hmm. So our viewers, though, there's a deadline there. That's right. Well, to I, think, first. I think if you believe the supermajority is locked here and there's and a Democrat can't win, right, or, or it can't even be competitive, then the party, or then the race is really won at the convention, you know, or at the primary uh, level. So you have to decide for yourself, like, do I want to participate in that? And as a Democrat, you can anyone can participate. But if you want to participate in the Republican side, in the supermajority side, you have to you have to affiliate. And I will say that the Democratic uh, nominee, or who will likely be the Democratic nominee for Senate, Kale Weston, is making great arguments. Uh, he is actually a very good candidate uh, and has a lot of important things to say. So uh, I, I do think there is a uh, something to be said about. But listen, uh, to your point, no. listen to the candidate and vote for who you actually want to win. And to me, he's one of the, like you talk center right, center left, he's right he's in there. In that space. Yeah, he's absolutely yeah. in there. Uh, one of the interesting points of this, too, because I want to get into what's happening in D.C. on our new United States Supreme Court. As we polled in the past, people in the state of Utah, in, even in presidential elections, the Supreme Court pick was one of those things Utah said that they were interested in. Rod, I want I wanted you to give us some idea of the flavor of what's happening right now on the, the proceedings, particularly through the lens of our delegation. Well, I think she'll be approved, uh, and I w I, I, I'm guessing Romney will vote yes. Lee will vote no. That would be my that would be my take on this right now. Uh, and it was funny to watch the proceedings over the last several days. Republican, you know, it was it was interesting. When Democrats attack a candidate, they're called passionate. When Republicans attack a candidate, they're called mean and brutal. I mean, I, I find that very, very interesting. But I don't, we didn't get many answers as to where she stands. I mean, Senator Leeds kept on pushing, what is, where do you stand? What is your judicial philosophy? And she still hasn't articulated that as of yet. And, and, she, but, you know, they, she may be, there may be a competition they're telling her, don't go there, because that's gonna, just going to open up some problems. But I, she'll be approved. Manchin came out today and said he'll approve it. So it's pretty certain that she, I think what Schumer would like to see would be to see a couple of Republicans come over so he can claim it's bipartisan. He may get three. He may get Collins, Murkowski, and Romney, and then he can claim it's bipartisan. I mean, I, 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 I think there were good question and answer exchanges on both sides and bad, really bad ones. And I think the bad ones have gotten worse and social media has made them famous. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's focusing on that. And I, I mean, you know, reading a children's book and, and some of the questions have been so bizarre. And, and some of the questions, like Senator Lee's question about, you know, how do you feel about court packing? Well, she doesn't decide court packing. I want to know how Senator Lee feels about court packing or how Mitt well, Romney feels about it. No, no, but, I mean, but, but, but you see what I'm saying? Like, it's their responsibility. So let's ask them those questions. Let's ask our Senate yeah. candidates those questions. So for me, it was frustrating to watch because we're supposed to be learning something about the candidate, and some of them did not allow it on both sides. Well, Both yeah, and, and I agree with Amy. The, you know, there's, there was performative stuff going on both sides to get their social media moments, and when they can raise <laughs> campaign cash off of that, uh, that happens every time. There were also some very interesting, very important conversations. I actually mm -hmm. thought the first round with Senator Lee and Judge Jackson was extraordinary. Yeah. They were yeah. talking way over all of our heads. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, they were, but they were talking about the meaning of the Constitution, and yes. it was this incredible, proper, high level back and forth about the meaning of the Constitution, and they came to an agreement. I mean, it was really well, and he, interesting and to even watch. Lindsey Graham on the Gitmo detainees, yeah, yeah. I I actually learned some things yeah, there. I yeah. thought it was a really interesting exchange. Yeah. Now it devolved into a yeah. 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 So and, and I think in the end, one of the things we have to remember on all of this, how political this has all become. Yeah. The reason it's become so political is Congress is not doing its job, so it defers and gives the executive branch power. And every president of every party will take that power and use it by executive order. And as soon as they act by executive order, somebody files a lawsuit, mm -hmm. and it goes through the courts, and it ends up at the Supreme Court. So that's why this is so contentious. Uh, and we should remember, uh, one Utah has sat on the Supreme Court, George Sutherland. The day he was nominated, he was in England giving a speech. And before the sun set on that very same day, he was confirmed unanimously to the Supreme well, Court. Hey Boyd, what a different time. <laughs> Boyd, we need a little history on that, because people don't realize, based on recent history, oh, there yeah. were times when you'd have no nay votes. Yeah. It was unanimous in some of these cases. You look like, like the Scalia days, where it was a bipartisan choice. 
what happened? Yeah, what's uh, changed? It, it's it's the policy, and I think it is that. I think it's the fact that Congress isn't doing its job, and so the executive branch is all too happy to take all of that power and use it. And again, any time a president acts by executive order, uh, somebody's going to file a lawsuit, and that's why all of these things get so contentious. And so then suddenly the Supreme Court appears to be far more important uh, than it actually is. I thought it was also very interesting. Uh, Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska, uh, he actually spent most of his time calling out all three three branches yeah, uh, that's uh, that's of that. And I think there's I something mean, to learn Congress from that. If Congress wanted to, to put Roe v. Wade in code, they could do it. Right? Yeah, that's like right. There, there are things they could do to solve some of these problems that they're like, they act like they're just yeah. here at the mercy of everyone, and yeah. I'm so just sad. Do, you, brought up <laughs> the, you, know, you brought up the past history. I yeah. think we would all agree. It probably started with Bork. Yeah. And since Bork, it's been, I'll get your guy, I'll get your guy. It's this back and forth. And what I thought was sad is that the New York Times last a week ago came out with a very interesting editorial on America and free speech. It was sad that the judge, could not express her opinion without causing problems, maybe within her own party or for the American people. That's what sank Robert Bork. He expressed his opinion, and he, he wrote about his various opinions, and a lot of people used that against him. And it would be interesting to see if a judge could say, here's what I think a woman is. Okay, without you know the dark money coming after her like crazy, and we're, I think that's where we are, and that's sad. But we're all journalists, and sometimes I don't want to know how a judge personally feels. Their job is not to do what they personally think is right or wrong. Their job is to to, to apply the law. But, but they and so say, I don't care. But they how always you say feel. I take my personal feelings aside and look at the law. Okay, then what are your personal feelings yeah. if but you're going to you, set those aside I, and then look at the law? If you know any judges, okay. and I'm married to a lawyer, so we know a few, <laughs> they don't even want to tell you in a personal conversation. They train themselves to set that. It's such a deep-seated part of you. You'd, why would you go into a hearing in Congress and then just start saying, "Oh, let me give you my two cents on them"? <laughs> They're not us. Sadly, Come on, Rod. <laughs> that's going to be our last comment there. Very interesting conversation, though. Appreciate that. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. The show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.